I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today by senior ballistician, Jaden Quinlan. Jaden, thanks for coming back on the show. Sure thing. Been on the show quite a bit as of recent and by popular demand. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, there was a big gap there for a while. It was pretty busy through the late summer and fall and now starting to slow down a little bit on the new product stuff, you know, now that oh, all yeah. that's launched. So yeah, when you guys give me a call and say, hey, can you free up two hours? That's a little easier to answer yes to now. Yep. Well, the people enjoy it. And, you know, with that gap of, you know, new product development, it's not like you're sitting idle. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on in the lab and it benefits the shooter. It benefits our customer. It benefits shooters that aren't our customers. It benefits the industry when you and your team are in the lab playing, um, not playing around, but when you, well, when you guys are in the lab playing around. I mean, you could say that. Yeah. yeah it benefits a lot of folks. So uh, thank you for that. Now, we spent a lot of time over the last year and a half of this podcast talking about shooting, mm-hmm. which is fun. Mm-hmm. And we talked about shooting stuff far away, which is also really fun. We've talked a little bit about you know, shooting handguns and we've talked about dispersion and how that affects everything from your pistol groups to your shotgun pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's fun. Pulling the trigger is fun. It's even funner when you hit what you're aiming at, especially if you're a long range target shooter or, you know, shooting trap with a shotgun. It's way more fun to shoot 25 straight than to to shoot 18 or 24 sometimes. Um, And it's, again, it's fun to do that stuff. Well, We haven't spent a lot of time talking about the not fun side of shooting. And I feel like barrel cleaning and barrel maintenance are things that, one, are filled with dogma. Mm -hmm. I mean, filled to the brim with dogma. uh, And then it's filled with some myths. And then it's filled with some antiquated ideas that, oh, this is what so-and-so did. And, you Mm -hmm. know, the... Marine Corps sniper school taught him that in 1994. And so that's what, you know, he's been doing ever since or whatever. And there are some truths in some of that. You know, mm-hmm. I think they say every rumor starts with the kernel of the truth. And I'm sure that's true with dogma and myth as well. Mm-hmm. However, it's 2023. We've learned a lot over the last hundred years of shooting. And here at Hornady specifically, we've really learned a lot in the last, well, 75 years. Uh, but in the last decade, let's say, because of the rate at which we're shooting, our yeah. ammunition production has gone up exponentially, and you can't produce ammo without shooting the ammo. Right. So all of our testing procedures, we've really uh, seen that increase, and we've seen some trends. And just anecdotally, you're a shooter. We've got the, a company filled with shooters mm-hmm. that shoot, gosh, bench rest competitions, and that, I mean, that's... I'm going to say the word cutthroat, and I don't mean it like, you know, people are getting knifed or whatever, but it's a highly, (laughs) highly competitive field where, you know, a couple tenths of an inch or an inch separates a lot of shooters. Got a lot of PRS shooters, three gun shooters, USPSA shooters, a lot of high volume shooting going on. Mm -hmm. And we've learned a lot about barrel maintenance, not to mention, and we'll talk about it, some cartridges, you know, there are newer cartridges that just... They're high performance cartridges, and you can't treat a modern high performance cartridge like you can an old school grocery getter kind of cartridge. You yeah. just can't do it. Mm-hmm. So, I'd really like to kind of lay some groundwork on barrel maintenance. Sure. Do we do it? There's a lot of folks that I know that do not clean their rifles until accuracy degrades, and that's their only metric mm-hmm. is. I'm not going to do any breaking and I'm not going to do any cleaning. I'm going to shoot the snot out of it until it doesn't shoot anymore. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, um, you know, obviously we'll start at the beginning like you always do and walk us through some of the why. Why do you need barrel maintenance? Why do you need to clean? What do we use for cleaning here? And I'm sure we'll get into a bunch more. Yeah. Well, barrel maintenance and, and cleaning and, and uh, staying on top of things is a lot like cleaning your toilet. Um, nobody wants to do it until. Either it's overflowing with your lack of clean or companies coming over, right? Uh, So it's not a fun job. It feels like a waste of time. There's no enjoyment. You're not getting that smack of a steel target, you know, every time you run the the cleaning brush down or something. So it's just not that enjoyable. But it's critical if you want to avoid problems. 
and that kind of comes with a whole bag of you know different magnitudes maybe you know if you're if you've got your beater gun that you just go out and plink with at the range and have a good time and you don't want to clean that thing okay if you're willing to accept the the issues that come along with that although keep in mind some of them can be catastrophic you know you can have catastrophic failures due to firearms maintenance especially so, in semi autos so yeah. not just you know you kind of have this spectrum you have on the on the lower end you might have function related issues of the firearm you know um if that's a bolt action you're you might have issues with extraction if it's a gas gun um you might have the same thing. You might start to leak primers, right? You might lock up the firing pin in your bolt from a pierced primer. Um, so there's these kind of function-related issues, but those aren't necessarily catastrophic, right? They're not really going to cause harm or, or a safety concern to the to the shooter or user necessarily, but it certainly can. I mean, if, if you let that go unaddressed, you can get to the point where you can blow a case head. You can... Uh, th- there's a whole spectrum, yeah. right? I mean, up until catastrophic failure, like barrel ruptures, bolt lug shear, some some crazy high pressure event could occur if if this goes unaddressed. So, it it is important from that regard, and, and the reason I say that is the the average guy that goes out and he's not in a in a high risk environment, and and his firearm is a tool. So let's say law enforcement, military, that thing cannot fail, or you or or one of your teammates may lose a life because of it, right? So that's a very weighty subject. Like you have to make sure that thing's okay. If you're just a recreational guy and you're like, you know, nobody's going to get hurt. Like, okay, if I pierce a primer, big deal. Um, but just understand that that recreational guy can end up in a bad circumstance too from not doing it. So, so there's a safety aspect to this that's very important. But like you said, we kind of have to start at the beginning and, and lay some groundwork that we laid in a podcast earlier we did the i think it was internal ballistics yep maybe we, we kind of talked about in detail that internal ballistic cycle and we have to cover some of that to understand why we need to clean and i i think this will probably be more than one episode i think it has to be more than one episode yeah so. i think this one will be you know what how it works why you need to clean um understanding that is important maybe a little bit about cleaning methods uh, if we get to it but then we're also working on some things to answer the question of how often should I clean? Mm-hmm. And we're looking at that from a, from a very data-driven standpoint and, right. and generating those, those numbers. Um, so, you know, uh, we'll be coming soon. I don't know yeah. when that part, will get part finalized. Part two of this episode, and that's a great point, is up until now, you clean. And if you ask anybody, if you called Hornady Technical Department, hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm shooting this cartridge, how often should I clean? The answer is going to be as needed because, mm-hmm. you know, that's just all there's ever been. Well, and then, you know, generally there's some round counts associated with certain things. Um, but as you alluded to, this part two will have a much more data driven approach to how you should approach a cleaning schedule. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in, in a very basic form, you know, that internal ballistic cycle, um, firing pin gets hit by the striker or the firing pin or the hammer, say on a revolver that has the firing pin nose on it, um, sends that, that flaming particulate into the propellant bed, starts it to burn, bullet starts to move out of the case neck, engraves into the rifling, travels down the bore. You have a constant change of volume that's happening. Um, go back and listen to that podcast to get the details on volume and, and pressure and stuff like that, because we'll be talking about that. But in, in very basic terms, you're talking about tens of thousands of pounds of pressure. So even on the very low end, your your lowest pressure cartridges, um, you're you're operating in the the ten thousand to ten thousand pound range. Mm-hmm. Um, up on the higher pressure side of things, um, not high pressure in a bad term, but just yeah. higher in, in a standardized window. window yeah. Yes, um, you're talking sixty five thousand psi. Well, that's a lot. You know, you think about how much psi you put in your tire. Mm-hmm. It's nowhere near that much. So you're you're dealing with a lot of pressure. You're also dealing with a lot of temperature. You're when that when that powder is at its height of of burn and pressure generation. There's thousands of degrees Fahrenheit that are that are inside the barrel. So that's those two things in combination. As you burn that propellant, it's going to create some buildup, some carbon buildup. Mm-hmm. The other thing you have happening is as the barrel or as the bullet is engraved into the rifling, 
the lands and the grooves. If if you're not real familiar with that, get on the internet and and look up a uh, land and groove barrel and look at some of those pictures, and you'll see that the the land actually cuts itself into the bullet's jacket, and so that material it has to go somewhere, and right. it's, it's scraped off the back of the bullet essentially as the bullet's traveling forward. That material is is coming off of the back of it, and in a lot of cases, some of that is deposited in bore, and depending on the bore conditions, if you have cracks or little pits or anything like that, generally that gets filled in with either copper or with carbon buildup. It's going to find a home. Yep. And after all of those little voids are gone, it's going to start to build up. And I, I think we talked about in the dispersion podcast, the the concept of, you know, you have a some jacket buildup down on one of the, down on one of the lands. And as the bullet passes by, it scrapes off more material from it. And that can tip the bullet in bore, kind of that hypothetical thing we were talking about there. So you can kind of envision that happening. Now, most most of this that we just talked about is the first couple inches down bore. That's where your large deposits are going to occur, especially from a carbon standpoint, because the peak pressure in the barrel is achieved within a couple inches of the start of the rifling. Let's say, you know, two to five inches, maybe yeah. as a general term. So that's where the majority of that buildup is going to occur. Um, now, the next piece of this puzzle is like is bore volume, because that plays in the volume plays into the pressure generation and, okay. and how rapidly that's going to happen. So, I generated a table here because we we generally don't think about things from a volume standpoint. We think about things from a bullet diameter standpoint. So, uh, you know, when I say seventeen cal, you kind of yeah, I think of a point one seven two diameter bullet. Yeah, the the the. Uh, the length across the the width of the bullet, essentially. So the 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 diameter is what we're so used to dealing with when we talk about bullets. But if we look at the relationship as you go up in bullet diameters and what that does to the bore volumes, it tells a totally different story. So if you go from a 17 cal to a 20 cal, you've gone up about 20% in bullet diameter. Okay. The bore area has gone up about 40%. It's a lot more. Yeah. Remember. The volume is what's playing into the pressure, not the bullet's diameter. Right. You go from 20 cal to 22 cal, your bullet diameter has gone up about 10%. Your bore area has gone up about 20%. So you can see this trend starting that the bore diameter is more responsive to a change in caliber, as we'd call it. Right. Um, six to six, five, you've, you've gone up about, you know, nine, 10% on bullet diameter, 17% bore diameter. You get up bore to the volume. Yeah, bore volume, sorry. Uh, you get up to the big stuff, say go from a 30 to a 338, your bullet's gone up 13% on diameter, 20% on bore area. The bore area always increases more than the diameter. Okay. So that plays into things when we start looking at cartridges that are a neck up, neck down. Uh-huh. Okay. So now you can start to see, okay, let's say, uh, let's just do uh, 243 and 308, just for very simple. Yep, simple uh, example. Both of them are burning around 40 grains of powder, say. When I take that 308 and turn it into a 243, I'm now burning the same amount of powder. It might be a different type, but the same amount of powder through a much smaller hole. So you have less, significantly smaller area. Significantly smaller. And so that starts to play into how much you know, carbon and copper material can you deposit in the bore before you start restricting that area as yeah. well. And essentially, you know, it makes total sense. The smaller the bore diameter is to start, the more of a percentage effect, let's say a half thousandths of buildup has, right? And so the other way to think about this is uh, a human hair is about three thousandths in diameter. So we're talking about a buildup of one sixth of a human hair. So if you take human hair and you slice it into six little pieces, that amount of buildup of say carbon, right in those those first couple inches of rifling, can be worth thousands of pounds of pressure. Mm. And so when and and it's not just the reduction in volume; it's also the change in the surface finish and 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 how the the bulleting interacts with that. So it's it's a couple different things. But the point is, as you don't clean you're going to build up carbon and copper. As you build up carbon and copper, you're definitely going to change the 
internal surface finish and the internal volume of the barrel, especially at that critical first couple inches. And you will affect pressures by doing that. So it it happens rather slowly though, right? As we shoot, we're not we're not burning that much powder, are we? I mean, you look at a 223, very high volume cartridge, right? Especially now that, that ARs are, are so prevalent. Yeah. Well, a, a 223 or 556 is going to burn in the mid 20 grain charge weight. Yeah, 25 range, right? to a, maybe 28 grains of powder. Yeah, maybe on, maybe on the high side. So so that's not that much. Like how much can that really leave in bore? But I think here in a second, I brought some show and tell. Um, okay. We have some powder in these jugs and we're going to pour it out so that you get an idea. If you're if you're a reloader or a hand loader, you're used to seeing powder and how much, you know, uh, correlating, well, this is this much. Mm-hmm. But for a guy that's only ever shot factory ammo, he probably has no idea. And, and hopefully this, this visual will help. But I mean, it, it, at that point, do you... Do you have any questions before we kind of proceed into that next phase? Again, I I, I leaned heavily on those prior podcasts yeah. for the detail part. But. Well, two things. Uh, one, like you'd mentioned right off the bat, if you haven't listened to our internal ballistics podcast or the podcast where we talk about propellant specifically, mm-hmm. um, I think those two podcasts are going to help you, one, just to understand what's going on, how things kind of work initially, and to talk about what the powder's leaving behind, mm-hmm. right? Um, so. That's one thing. And then the other thing was, I think you did a great job. And this uh, analogy makes a lot of sense to me, not necessarily an analogy, but the way you described it, the 308 versus 243, if you have a 308 with 40 grains of propellant, it's going to leave X amount, you know, whatever amount of carbon buildup from the burning propellant in Mm -hmm. a bore that's 30 caliber. And then you're going to have that exact same amount roughly, but in a six millimeter. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't, you know, kind of help the listener really start to understand and conceptualize how that works, you have a a certain amount of carbon, let's say from the propellant that has to go somewhere. And if you have a 243 or a 708 compared to a 308, you're going to have very similar amounts of carbon depending on the propellant, obviously, uh, but you're going to continually put into a smaller and smaller hole. Mm -hmm. And that goes from 308 to 708. 243 to 22, 243. Yep. Um, so you can see why uh, it becomes more critical to clean with those higher charge weights and smaller bore volumes. Yes. And that goes up and down. So if we're talking 22 Creedmoor compared to 6.5 Creedmoor or 6.5 PRC compared to 7 PRC compared to 300 PRC, mm-hmm. you still have a really large charge volume in a progressively smaller area to put that given amount of buildup. Right. Right. So... Uh, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to reiterate those points. Now, Hornady offers Sub-X component bullets from 308 up to 458. The Sub-X features a lead core and is designed to provide deep penetration and high weight retention at reduced velocities. The patented flex tip combined with long grooves in the gilding metal jacket ensure excellent expansion at velocities down to 900 feet per second, delivering big results without the big bang. Sub X bullets from Hornady. And that brings up uh, another thing that we need to talk about, which is the diameters and dimensions of the chamber itself. Okay. Because they're not all equal, right? right? Not not all cartridge designs have the same chamber tolerances. And when I say chamber tolerances, mainly what I mean is the distance from the chambered cartridge to that aspect of the chamber. So yeah. if it's a diameter, you know, how how big is the free bore diameter compared to the bullet diameter. That gives you an idea yeah. of how much clearance there is. Right? And the angle. And the angle. And and how much jump to the rifling is there. Mm-hmm. Because I think we covered it in detail in that internal ballistics podcast, but the the jump to the rifling or the amount of free movement that the bullet has before it hits the rifling or the forcing cone or meets resistance from another source, maybe carbon buildup, mm, yeah. uh, is is one of the the, the heavy hitter voting parties on why you will get the pressure you get meaning if the bullet has a lot of free run before it hits resistance that causes a large increase in volume in the cartridge case or behind the bullet and that's going to cause pressure to drop increase in volume it is dynamic so it's constantly changing but the the inverse of that if it's very short bullet is right up against the resistance of rifling or carboning or whatever it is 
you're not going to have very much volume increase behind the bullet before it hits that resistance and pressure will respond to that pressure goes up so when we talk about cartridges even though we use that 243 in that 308 example that's not the only defining metric you could have a 308 that has very tight cartridge dimensions. Yeah, let's, let's say, say a 308 match reamer. Sure. Which is, you know, you can get the Palma match reamer from any manufacturer that makes a reamer, and it's a pretty damn accurate chamber. Mm -hmm. And let's say that, that the ammunition you're loading for it, you're you're seating the bullets, you know, five thousandths off the lands. Uh, you're you're pushing you're pushing up towards the maximum loadings, so pressures, you know, let's say in the sixty thousand pound range. And the clearances over the bullet and the clearances in that, that forcing cone area of the chamber are very tight. And you want them tight because that lends to good dispersion, right? We kind of know that. Now, let's say that 243. We know that it has a significantly, we're burning the same amount of powder, let's say at the same pressure through a, through a much smaller hole. But let's say that the jump to the rifling is 100 thousandths versus that 5 thousandths of the 308. And that the, the clearances over the bullet are double. Yeah, so you've got yeah, more space. Yeah, All, and, and angle too. I, I know that one. We usually run a degree and a half. Mm -hmm. That's uh, pretty standard. Yeah. yeah, but there's some cartridges like the seven millimeter M to Magnum that's got a three degree, and mm -hmm. there's some that are even more severe than that. Right. It could be the case that that two forty three, although we're burning the same amount of powder through a smaller hole, the fact that it has more clearances and there's more bullet jump to the rifling, will build up fouling in those first couple inches at a different rate maybe a slower rate than this 308 that's right up against the rifling and everything is constrained very yep. tightly and so that just bore volume rule doesn't define the whole thing it's right. it's a piece to consider yep. and you have to consider it but there's more to it than yeah. that and another one another good example of that would be a 243 winchester standard sammy chamber and a six creedmoor mm -hmm. with standard sammy chamber mm -hmm. you're burning very similar propellant charges and burn speeds you know mm -hmm. 4350 for example great powder for both of them but the dimensions like you're talking about are different and the cleaning schedules are going to be different as well and the the way that that carbon deposits is going to be different yeah and back to your analogy of kind of having a race car versus a, an old grocery getter um you can look at the the six creed more and you can see that thing is much more race car-esque than the 243 is by the bullets that it can accept by the angles of the cartridge by the chamber design all of that stuff so you have to treat that thing with more care the the 243 is a direct comparison to that six creedmoor can likely on av on the average gun the average dimensions out there can withstand less cleaning before a problem shows up than say a six creedmoor can however are you going to get the levels of performance out of the 243 no there's nothing for free right so the trade off is because the because the chamber has more dimensions and it's more forgiving uh, dimensionally to fouling and buildup and lack of mm -hmm. maintenance. The trade-off for that is those larger dimensions result in performance that is not as precise as what you get yep. out of the six screen. And then another kind of direct comparison to that, but the inverse would be a six millimeter arc compared to a six millimeter Creedmoor. Mm -hmm. Let's say you run them in a bolt gun at the same pressure, 60,000 pounds. Well, now you have very similar chamber dimensions. Mm -hmm. You know, the chamber and the throat designed almost identical, you know, as far as dimensions and tolerances. And, and tolerance over bullet. But now you're burning 30 grains of powder instead of 40 grains of powder and they're different burn speeds and the maintenance is way different. The barrel life is way different. Exactly. Um, so hopefully the, that helps the listener understand kind of the relationship like you'd mentioned at the beginning. It's not just bore volume. Mm -hmm. It's bore volume uh, plus tolerances and dimensions plus, you know, the charge weight and the type of powder. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and we're riddled with examples like that. Uh, just uh, if, if the listener leaves with one thing, I think it should be your analogy of if you're driving a race car, you might need to spend a little more time maintaining it than if it's the grocery getter, because that, that, that applies definitely universally. Now, we used an example uh, a couple months back during an event we had in it, and it went off pretty well. So if you're only listening to this podcast, you might want to jump on when you can see it because we have some visual aids here. But mm -hmm. what we started to look at was, well, it's it's hard to it's hard to bridge the gap because uh, of of uh, how much powder we've burned based on how many rounds we fired, right? Because we even with a precision rifle setup in a volume 
use case, you know, the the PRS or the NRL type stuff, or or even bench rest. What does two hundred rounds look like? Like how much powder did I just put through yeah. that little hole in that barrel that's so small that I can't even fit a pencil into it, right? Yeah. How much powder did I burn through there? And just looking at the physical relationship between how much powder you've burned in that small of a hole. Uh, the the example that we did that with really helped, and the feedback we got was was folks said, "Wow, that that really opened my eyes and made me understand much easier why I need to clean." Because it's all kind of lived in this hypothetical space where it's like, "Well, you need to cleaner. You know, I don't I don't need to clean." And all this stuff, there's no nothing solid for you to see and and base that understanding on. So, sure. What I've what I've got next is a table of uh, of a bunch of different cartridges. We have a nine millimeter Luger, so this would be on the low end, right? Yep. Uh, all the way through 223, 6 Creed, 6 Arc, 6 5 Creed, 6 5 PRC, 308, 300 PRC, and 338 Lapua. So you can have a spectrum of cartridges, right? And maybe you don't shoot specifically one of those, but you shoot one that's close to it, so this example will still apply. So if we look at 9mm, 9mm runs pretty low charge weights, you know, 4 to 6 grain range, and pressures operate in the 30,000 pound range. So if we if we take this powder here, and this is... Uh, this is scrap powder. That, yeah, this uh, is this is. Uh, so it's going to be a mix of ball and extruded and flake and. We're and not hurting to. Varget, so, so everybody knows. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour some on the table here, and hopefully I don't make too big of a mess, which I'm probably going to. All right, so maybe a little bit more. Obviously, you're not running extruded powder in a nine millimeter, but that's probably about a tenth of a pound of powder. Yep. So every hundred rounds of nine millimeter you fire, that's what's been burned down that barrel. And that's a big, big hole. It is. Nine, yeah, it is. And do you have to clean a nine millimeter every hundred shots, or it has function issues, or starts to blow primers, or you have pressure issues, or something? God, like that? I hope not. <laughs> I've never experienced that. I've shot a lot into different nine millimeters, and I don't know how many, probably hundreds of thousands of rounds of nine millimeter, and uh, I've never seen that happen. Now, right. could it happen? Certainly, you can get function-related issues. A lot of that comes from the the gunk buildup, right? Not yeah. so much of the buildup in bore that's that's causing pressure-related issues, but the the operation of the slide and yeah, friction semi-automatics, and stuff like that, right? Okay, well, let's. So that's about a hundred rounds, a nine millimeter. Yeah. Okay. And and the rifle stuff, we 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 don't hit a hundred rounds with any of that stuff. So we gotta we gotta keep going. So if we pour some more powder out here, take a look here, a little bit more. This is a swag too, so this is just for an example purpose. Okay, that's probably about 0.4 to 0.5 grains of powder. With a 223... 0.5 pounds, half yeah, a pound. Yeah, sorry, did I say grains? Yeah. Yeah, pounds. We're talking in pounds here. With a 223, that's worth about 100 shots. Whoa, that looks so, like a lot of powder. That's three 30-round magazines in an AR. That's, that's quite it. a bit. Yeah, that's a lot of powder for 100 rounds and when a, you see it. And a 22 cal, a 223 or, or a 556 is a pretty small hole down the barrel. Yep. Now, how much of that is going to be, you know, changed from the, the solid state that it's in now into a gas state during the burning of the propellant that propels the bullet down the barrel? And how much of it is going to be solidified into the byproduct of it burning in the form of carbon? Don't know. It's hard, it's hard to say. It depends on a whole bunch of different variables. But... But you know that when you shoot, you see the evidence of carbon, right? There's that, that oh yeah, that smudgy carbon buildup on the bolt. Yeah, if the case on a semi-auto, yeah, case is sooty. Yep, exactly. Wow. And that's one of the points that we struggle in is we can't really, we can't really, you know, go walk down the barrel and look at the sidewall of it and be like, yeah, that's a lot of carbon buildup, right? You can kind of hold it up and look through it, but you don't have a good vantage point there. You can use a bore scope. Bore scope. That certainly helps. helps. Um, but say specifically with an AR. If you've cleaned an AR and you've taken the bolt out of the bolt carrier, um, on the back of the bolt behind the, the gas rings that are there is kind of that little radius area before the, the nose that your firing pin goes through. And a lot of AR shooters that have done volume shooting will, will, will recognize that that's an area that carbon builds up because that's where that gas comes in and dumps to, to separate the carrier and the bolt from each other during unlocking. And that carbon's not real easy to get off. I've, I've had to scrape it off with like a brass screwdriver, mm -hmm. you know, after soaking it with solvents and stuff. Well, that's, that never experienced anything near 
the 60, amount of pressure pounds or 50,000 pounds. <laughs> yeah. And the temperatures yeah, that it did just in bore. So you can take that as an example. And I, and I use that just because ARs are very common. So a lot of people will have a touch point with that example. If it's that hard to get that carbon off, how hard do you think it is to get that stuff out of that first couple inches of the barrel is? Quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if we, if we continue on, I'm just going to dump this whole pound. And I brought an eight pounder full. I don't know if it's going to fit on this little board here or not without making a big mess, but okay. That's one pound of powder. So in a nine millimeter, that's worth around a thousand rounds. That's, that's a lot of powder. shooting. That's more than, that's more than I would have thought, you know, oh, yeah. like before I had ever done this example myself, just thinking about it conceptually, if you would have poured that out and said, how many rounds in nine millimeter? meter would you have to fire to equal that much powder burned out? It's like, ah, 2,500 yeah, is my, would have been my guess. I've loaded a lot of nine millimeter and I know how much powder I'm using and it's not very much. That's right. And when you see it all, yeah, it, it, you wouldn't have thought it'd be that much. If we start to go into rifle stuff, that would be worth about 250 rounds, two, 200, 250 rounds of 223. Hmm. I've done that in... A couple, couple hours, minutes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, definitely a couple minutes in in uh, yeah, some in of the, the past previous lives. life, yeah. But um, yeah, that's a lot of powder. Uh, let's keep going. Let's pour some more out. Oh, that's that's only. Sorry to interrupt. That's only a hundred rounds of six five PRC. Yeah. So for all the six five PRC shooters that or, or short magnums in general, right? Because well, they yeah. all have similar so, uh, charge yeah, rates. Three hundred wisdom. Seven Psalm, you know, had that resurgence for the long range crowd. Six five PRC. Um, look at this powder, and that's a hundred rounds. So the the one of the crowds. That and this we, is the the upper end charge yeah, weight, right? Yeah. We hear this uh, from you know some of the some of the precision rifle crowd. You know, my precision rifle, six five Treadmore, let's say, mm -hmm. or six dash or something like that. You know, I don't even think about cleaning it till it's two, three, four hundred yard or rounds. Well, I'll just do the same for my 6.5 PRC hunting rifle. I don't, I don't, I don't clean it till I have to. That's a hundred rounds. Yeah. And, and that's about 200 to 250 rounds of kind of the standard stuff. So six Creed, six, five Creed, 308, 708, 243, 22, mm -hmm. How many, how many times have you taken one of those cartridges and shot 400 rounds without cleaning? I've done that. My 6.5 Creed. I've burned twice that, that powder in there. Whoa. That's crazy. That right. is crazy. Okay, I'm going to try to pour some more powder here. So for the guy that's just listening that isn't watching this. There's a lot of powder on the table. I have a foam board on a table, and I'm trying to pour a bunch of powder without making a giant mess. Doing great. Let's see. I'll t I'm just going to take a look at what's left here. And make Spoiler alert, we're not going to light this on fire. No. All right, I'm going to say I poured out about somewhere between two and three pounds. We already had a pound out there. So we got three to four pounds worth of powder sitting on the table right now. That's 500 rounds in a six Creed, six, five Creed, 308. Yeah. That's a lot of powder. Yeah. And we've all shot 500 rounds through those cartridges you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, look at six Creed or six, five Creed. That's a warm up. Let me check zero, run it out, stretch the legs, make sure everything's good on a Friday and then shoot a two day PRS match. Mm -hmm. That's that much powder. Well, let's look at some of the big magnums. Yeah, what about, uh, you know, with a 300 PRC, so we have, what did we say, three to four pounds sitting yep. out there? That's probably three, 300-ish rounds out of, a, out of a big magnum. So a 300 PRC, a 300 Wind Mag, right? A 30 Nosler, that kind of stuff. A 338 Lapua. Um, we're talking about 200 shots. 200 shots from Lapua. So the guys that go to the Night Force ELR and run a Lapua, that's getting cooked off. Yeah. 338 diameter hole. Yeah. So as we talk about this, I hope what you can envision is when you have, when you don't clean your gun and you start to experience issues with it, this gives you a visual as to, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense why I can only get, you know, 400 shots. And if I don't clean somewhere around 400, I start piercing primers and then losing primers. Yeah. Or if velocity gets erratic. Exactly. You see or that one. Or dispersion. dispersion. Right. Dispersion is one I've got a, a good friend of mine in the outdoor riding community that uh, just witnessed that in his 6.5 PRC. It's, you know, in the heart of hunting season and shooting monolithic bullets and just ran into some atrocious dispersion. Mm -hmm. Got his gun cleaned up and everything dialed right back in. Yeah. 
All right, we're pouring more powder. See if I can edge it over here a little bit. So I'm going to say that was worth about five pounds now, plus a pound, so we're at six pounds of powder. That's going to be worth maybe 1,700 rounds of 223. Okay. I know a lot of guys, I probably have done it myself, definitely have done it myself, that haven't cleaned an AR every 1,500 rounds. I guarantee it. There's, I could think back to a couple times where I've probably shot that in a week. Mm-hmm. Maybe even a long weekend. Yeah. Think about like training rifles for law oh, enforcement yeah. or military, where these are kind of schoolhouse rifles that are just used for, you know, new student orientation or, or basic quals or whatever. Often you think those things are getting cleaned. Who knows? But very easy to, you know, a cycle of students or two have burned oh, yeah. that much powder through that thing. Sure. Uh, going on up the, the cartridges here. What did we say? We got six pounds out yep. there. So you're talking maybe 600 rounds of like the Creedmoor 308 family. I can certainly start to understand seeing that, how I might be able to get away with that with the 308. Right. But yep. a six Creedmoor, I might happen. start to have issues. Guaranteed. Right? Well, not a guarantee, but it could. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, continuing on, you're talking a little over probably, I don't know, somewhere in the, let's see. Well, the one that shocks me looking at this chart is the 300 PRC. That's yeah. only 500 rounds of 300 PRC. Yeah, and and all those big magnums, right? Yeah, the three hundred so, wind mag. Is so a, this would be, uh, you know, a seventy to eighty grain charge weight cartridge. So for the hand loader or reloader out there listening, if you're running charge weights like that, this is this, this is, is about five hundred rounds. And, and with the, with the old Lapua, um, probably around four hundred rounds, which is barely getting started. You know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of people I know that shoot the Lapua love to stretch the legs. They usually got some place they can take it out to you know, a mile or 2,000 yards or whatever. Right. And 400 rounds is, you know, in the in the lifespan of a gun, not that much. Yeah. That's a lot of powder. Yeah. And when we're talking, let's go back to nine millimeter maybe. Uh, I'd have to do this math real quick. This is probably going to be worth about 6,000 rounds of nine millimeter. That's, that's that's a lot of powder burned through that little That's that a lot of trigger system. pulls. Yeah. Um, for the AR, uh, I think we, we already covered the AR, right? We said yeah. around 17 something. We'll keep going here. We'll see if we can get the rest of this out here, which would put us at nine pounds. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it all without spilling it. I believe you. Very delicate. And hopefully, you know, the listener is starting to connect the dots too on on how the cartridge plays into the the sensitivity of it, right? How robust it can handle abuse and so much mm -hmm. powder being burned through it. Um, Whoa. That's nine right, so that's pounds nine, of propellant. Yeah, that's that's nine pounds. So for for a two twenty three, that's probably in the I don't know, twenty five. I don't even have it on my chart, so I'm just swagging this math off the top of my head, but maybe let's say twenty five hundred yeah. rounds ish. That's a lot of trigger pulls on an AR, and yeah. I bet there's a lot of folks that haven't cleaned an AR in 2,000 rounds. Yeah, and how many ARs out there have 10,000 rounds on them? Yeah, well, and I we've seen this here uh, a bunch of times where semi-autos, AR-15s in particular, like you mentioned, sometimes, okay, you have some velocity that gets erratic, you know, kind of erratic pressure, accuracy degrades. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are an inconvenience. Right. Well, you let this much powder get burned up into a system without cleaning it, it can go from an inconvenience to a damaged firearm. Yes. Yep. Where, like you said, case heads rupture. Uh, that case wants to stick in the chamber. There's been a bit dramatic pressure spike. The bolt unlocks early. Your bolt lugs are letting go, ripping case heads off. Now you've got a round stuck in the chamber, mm -hmm. a broken bolt, a bulged receiver. It it can get bad in a hurry. Yeah. And and this happens a lot in the law enforcement world um, and, and military as well. And what is, what is to blame? 
Oh, it's the ammo. That's high pressure ammo that caused that because the event looks like is it's indistinguishable from when you do actually have ammo that is high on pressure as it should not be. Mm -hmm. And it causes an event. That event looks identical. You can't tell the difference between that and the result of no maintenance and burning this much powder through and having what is now an increase in pressure, not at the fault of the ammunition, but of, of, of the system that it's being fired through, the amount of carbon buildup, the copper buildup in the barrel, all of that stuff, that carbon ring that has now shortened the amount of free run the cart or the bullet has before it gets to the to engraving. All all of that plays in. So uh all right, let's keep going down the list. So we got nine pounds out there. With like a Creedmoor family, we're probably talking like somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred rounds. Yeah, that this is this is the life of a six Creedmoor barrel on right average. Here. Yeah. Yep. When you look at a firing event and how long that event takes, right? A six Creedmoor has a barrel life of about six seconds. Yeah. That's how long the barrel life of a six Creedmoor is based on the, yeah, the life cumulative band. temperature and pressure, right? So this propellant is going to be fired up in about six seconds over the course of a six Creedmoor's barrel life. That's crazy so to think, to, isn't it? Yeah. Zoom out from what we're talking about for a second and picture a six millimeter hole, this much propellant and six seconds. And it's no wonder that, you know, those hot rod sixes that are so popular for long range shooting now, mm -hmm. you know, you, you pull the pipes between 900 and maybe 1400 rounds. Yeah, absolutely. Utilize your space your way with the modular Hornady Security Square Lock Organizing System. Mount the square lock panels anywhere in your home or shop. Then attach the wide assortment of square lock accessories to securely store firearms, tools, gear, or any other valuables in any possible configuration. Keep your reloading bench or gun room organized with the square lock modular organizing system from Hornady Security. Uh, continuing, let's say, into the short magnums, that's a thousand rounds of the short mag. So 6.5 PRC, the 300 WISM. Um, Seven Psalm. Yeah. And you can start to see that, yeah, that, that, that's a lot of powder by the time I get that many rounds on the barrel. And I can understand now why I had to clean to keep problems at bay or why dispersion started to get worse or why velocity started to migrate. Mm -hmm. Or... I close the bolt. Everything's groovy. I'm not getting weird pressure. My accuracy is great, but man, I didn't shoot that shot and I rolled the bolt and that bullet is stuck mm -hmm. in the chamber yep. and you just poured powder. Uh, I've, I've seen that happen and it's, it's not pretty. It's such an inconvenience. Yep. And you talked about the tolerances and the dimensions associated with hot rod cartridges, with sports car cartridges, and there's not a whole lot of room mm -hmm. and you start filling it up with what this amount of powder leaves, and it, yeah, it's it's no wonder that you might end up with a stuck bullet or a cartridge that wants to chamber hard because that bullet is is in it's it's experiencing a a mismatch in fit. It simply doesn't fit because of the buildup. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm glad you, you the timing of you bringing that up is perfect because I was going to give an example. I was teaching a course one time to a uh, to a law enforcement entity, a pretty notable one. I'll I'll leave their name out of it, but uh, there was a, a newly trained sniper that was, that was going through this training and he had been on for maybe a year or two in that role. So fairly fresh guy. Uh, we're, we're going through some training stuff and he, he has a round chambered in an AR-10 we called the line cold and he went to extract a loaded round and exactly what you said is what happened. Goes to pull the charging handle back quite a bit of resistance strong fit guy like i'll get this thing out of here you sure, know yeah. does the old buttstock mortar uh yeah. to get the to get the bolt open with the charging handle cartridge case flings out powder goes everywhere bullets still in the barrel i said well how many how many rounds would you say are on this barrel well he didn't have a specific count um i said okay well on average how many rounds are you firing in 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 training and and deployment of this rifle throughout the year and he estimated you know somewhere between one and two thousand rounds well if we look at our chart down here the amount of powder that you see on the table that's in a 308 winchester that's the equivalent of probably you know 12 to 1300 rounds maybe so he had burned that much powder through that system and then it had built up enough of a carbon ring that it gripped 
around his bullet when that cartridge was chambered. Yeah. Well, you got the bolt mass sending that thing home. So it's going to shove it in there. Yep. It's going to fit. And when he was shooting him, he never noticed anything. He wasn't recording velocity, right? He wasn't looking at his brass and, and seeing if there was any pressure signs or anything like that. He was just shooting it. Didn't observe any issues until he went to extract the loaded round. Now he has a dead gun. We have to have a cleaning rod or something available to go in through the muzzle and tap that bullet out of there. So that's that's just a real world example of a problem that many people have had or they've heard about. Or but, they've seen at the range, you know, some guy down, you know, three benches down from you. It's, yeah, it happens. Yeah. But now you have a visual of that. And that, that carbon ring building up again goes back to the dimensions of the chamber. The, the larger the clearances are in that, that throat freebore area, the more you can neglect cleaning it and burn this much powder through it and not stick a bullet into that carbon ring. All other things being equal. Sure. So that's, that's important. It's back to your race car thing again. Uh, if we continue on to 300 PRC, probably around 700 rounds. That's a lot. That's, yeah, that's a lot of powder. And 700 rounds, it sounds like a lot of shooting. But it, you talk about the military sniper, somebody that's actually, you know, fueling a 300 PRC between training and, and you know, going around to different shooting schools and that kind of thing. That's really not that much shooting, especially in a shootable platform. Right. You know, uh, even the, the recreational guy that, okay, you know, got a really nice long range rifle. This is fun. It's, it's not uncommon to shoot 50 to 100 rounds per session because mm-hmm. it's a shootable gun. I can literally shoot. Right. A 300 PRC and a, you know, nice stock with a muzzle breaker or a suppressor, I shoot it all day. Right. So 700 rounds really isn't that much time behind the gun. No, that's a, that's a one week training package. Yeah. That's easy, but you've burned that much powder through it. Now, the other thing to think about is that, that propellant can work in as a, as an abrasive in those first couple inches of the barrel too, right? Because this stuff is in the process of burning. It has a, still has a physical form to it. Pressure is building, heat is building. And that powder is being pushed down that early portion of the barrel and scraping along the sides. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's an additional, you know, kind of thing to think about. So all of this brings up the, okay, well, that's all great. I, un- I understand this now in, in a different way than, than I did before. And I understand why I need to clean. Um, how do I clean? Yeah. Well, before we get to how do you clean, I'd like to get your opinion, uh, not prepared for this, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. On you mentioned carbon ring, mm-hmm. and that's kind of a, it's not a new thing, but it's kind of a, it's kind of like uh, transonic instability. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like one of those demon words that right. people throw around. Uh, and again, I say it's kind of new because cartridges that are modern and cartridges that are being used in high volume precision shooting, they tend to exhibit these more often than say a seven mag or 243 or any of those. Uh, so you mentioned that you think the tolerances are more associated with carbon rings uh, than, you know, a, a looser, quote unquote, looser tolerance, uh, like 243 compared to six Creedmoor kind of example. Well, I think the, the observable effects of it are more noticeable. Oh, okay. The, 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 the presence of it, I, I, I don't think that is necessarily tied to that. That's a function of amount of, amount of powder being burned pressure it's being burned at, flame temp of the powder as it relates to the pressure, and where the projectile is in bore at those at those times. At those times. Okay. So what I mean by all that is the reason I would expect to see the negative effects of, you know, what's colloquial called a carbon ring in the shooting community, which is it necessarily a ring of carbon that forms not necessarily. It can it, be. It, it's more so the starting point at which carbon has formed excessively enough where you can observe it. Yeah. And it's usually hard as a friggin' diamond. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's very hard. <laughs> and so observation may be, I can put a bore scope in and see it. I can start to see it with the naked eye. Right see if I just bullet. look down the bore, I can see scrapes on my bullet or my bullet didn't come out when I extracted a live round. Um, so there's different ways to observe that, that that's happening. But that, that carbon buildup there is, is what is kind of generally referred to as a carbon ring. Okay. So that, that was helpful. Thanks for explaining that. And then yeah. you were about to get into, okay, this is all fine and dandy. Yes. A lot of powder, not a lot of bore volume. I get that. How do I do it? Or how often do I do it? And like we talked about at the beginning, we have a part two to this 
which is a lot, uh, you know, kind of a data driven approach to how often you should do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I meant to, didn't mean to cut you off there. You're good. So cleaning is a loaded term because you can clean wrong and you can clean right. Or let's say the efficacy of cleaning can be there and it cannot be there. Um, a lot of the methods that we're taught about how to clean a firearm are, like you said, they're shrouded in dogma or this is the way my dad did it or this is the way my grandpa did it or this is the way... Sniper side told me to do it or yeah, YouTube. Or military, right? Yeah. Um, that that was technically the first place I guess I saw like a standardized cleaning recommendation, yeah. right? Before that, it was kind of like uh, yeah, you, that you buy the cleaning kit and then you use the parts in it. Like that's how you clean it, you know, like there was no details. Um, but the big area that we see, I mean, cleaning, barrel cleaning is so important to our day-to-day operations here because in the, in the process of manufacturing ammunition, the test barrel needs to be a constant. If the test barrel is shifting all over the place and it's, it's interaction with the ammunition and the, the recorded result of firing it, then the ammunition is going to be low quality because the test barrel is artificially shifting the way the ammo is based on the condition of the barrel. So right. we normalize that through two things. One is the firing of reference ammunition, which is an assessment of the barrel against a baseline. Baseline ammunition should perform like this. If it doesn't, that's associated as to a difference in the barrel that's causing that. Um, but also from a cleaning standpoint, we try to we try to keep the barrels in as similar of a state as we can as we manufacture ammunition. Well, what's the most constant state you can have? Clean or close to clean. Because when you get dirty, well, how do you know how dirty is dirty? Yeah, right? you got a little bit of dirty, you got medium dirty, right? As we're building this mountain of powder <laughs> here. And different kinds of powder. Right. Are, some are cleaner than others. You know, the some of them, you know. As a reloader, it feels like the Alliant line of high-performance propellants that I've used, Reloader 16, Reloader 26, Reloader 23, they tend to be pretty darn dirty mm-hmm. um, compared to cartridge or propellants. You know, Varget, for example, I, I have not experienced that to be very, quote-unquote, dirty. But again, right. that's all yeah, subjective. All different, right? And it's all like, that's just my assessment. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So, so we try to keep things in a state as of, of clean because that's consistent and repeatable versus some level of arbitrary dirtiness, right? Um, now, how do, we, how do we clean? Find the latest shirts, hats, hoodies, and accessories that you see here on the podcast and much more at HornadyGear.com. There's a ton of different solvents that are out there there's a ton of different methods everything from pulling a boar snake through a barrel or some sort of gun sock type thing Mm -hmm. um through running a bronze brush or no a nylon brush or a stainless steel brush or Or no no brush brush and just patches and no don't use patches because they leave remnants of fiber behind use uh cotton or some other material right there's all these different things out there what we have found is that it comes the, the, the method, let's say, brush or no brush, or patch or no patch, that, that would be methodology. That is not as critical as the solvent type you're using. What we've found is the only way to, to physically remove the really hard carbon buildup that you see is by like mechanically removing it with, say, a cutting tool. Mm. So like a, you, a brush isn't going to get it if out. If you let it go to her, like the quote-unquote carbon ring, mm-hmm. yeah, you're not going to solvent that out of there. Right you essentially have to cut that out or abrasively remove yeah. it, right? Um, and you want to avoid that because that's... You can take that too far. can of worms. Yeah. yeah, you can really mess stuff up with that. So the solvent is what's really doing the cleaning job for you because regardless of the mechanical method you're using, whether that's pulling a, a rope-based deal or a you know a wire rope with, with rubber on it down to pull your, your uh, brush through or you actually have a cleaning rod and all that stuff, the, the mechanics of that aren't really removing anything besides surface level stuff. The solvent is what's going to actually break up the carbon or the or the copper buildup mm-hmm. and allow you to then remove it when it becomes like a surface status of material. Okay. Um, not all solvents are equal. That's and true. And there's a lot of solvents that we've tested that claim that they do X. Eat carbon, eat copper, do both, whatever, right? They they do everything. They mm-hmm. they eat the carbon, they eat the copper, they lube it. They, you know, they don't collect yeah. dust, right? They do everything. Yeah, you can wash your dishes with it. You, you can use it at, yeah, if you got yeah. achy joints, yeah, yeah low get, tire pressure. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, very few solvents we've found will actually 
the efficacy of them is is true. They they do what they say they do. Um, I'll probably leave names out of it for right now. Okay. Um, but we did a big study. Well, the, and a lot of this comes from Matt George. The, the credit yeah, he's needs been on to the be podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Matt's Matt's pioneered a lot of the the discoveries made on the cleaning side in our in our ballistics lab. Um, and Matt had done a test where he took. Uh, we we're looking at you know effective uh, copper solvents. And he took bullets and put them in like the little cough medicine cups with yeah. all these different solvents that we bought. Yeah. Miked um, them. Miked the bullets beforehand. So measured them with a micrometer, the diameter of the bullet. Put them in those solvents for a fixed period of time. Pull them out, wipe them off, measure it again. If if this thing eats copper, it should eat the copper off of a jacket of a bullet. And essentially two of them did um, that were a non-ammonia-based cleaner. Yeah. So you will hear about ammonia-based cleaners. Those things work really good, but they come with the caveat of if you misuse them, they can damage the barrel. Mm-hmm. Um, abrasive cleaners. We we have done some stuff with abrasive cleaners, and at times we will use it to, to remove like heavy carbon, carbon. buildup. Yeah. I feel like if you're going to be using an abrasive cleaner, you would be advised to also have a bore scope. A bore scope, and I would recommend a reference ammunition. Now, oh, that sure. doesn't have to be the you know standardized stuff that we use as an Just, industry. Yeah, but stuff how, that you've tested. I, I recommend you do that all the time anyway. Like if you're if you're a factory ammo shooter, then set aside a box or two of that factory ammo that's of the same lot that you're going to go shoot for whatever shooting you're doing. Set that stuff aside. Uh, if you're a reloader or hand loader, load yourself up some extra ammo that's of the same recipe and just let it sit there and label it <laughs> reference or you know some sort of yeah designation and as you as you start shooting especially if you have the ability to record velocities if you start to you know let's say you don't want to clean because of whatever reason it is then by nature of this discussion you're expecting something to change if i continue to not clean mm-hmm. well how do you assess how close you are to that line well, one way is by shooting reference ammunition. So if I I take this, uh, I, I load me up a batch of a couple hundred rounds that I'm going to use for some matches coming up in practice. Mm-hmm. I shoot 10 rounds of that over a chronograph, you know, when I'm getting my zero or whatever, and I have the velocity of that. And then I go and I shoot a match and I do a little bit of practice and and I haven't cleaned anything. I'm like, well, man, am I, do I need to clean or not? I can take those couple boxes I set aside and reshoot that for velocity. Now, it's not a guarantee, but generally, pressure trends with velocity. The correlation is, is fairly high, one of the highest in internal ballistics. And so if I shoot that reference box of ammo after a couple hundred rounds fired, and I see that my velocity has now increased 75 feet per second from the baseline it was at before, mm-hmm. I can attribute that to, because the ammunition is identical. The only thing that's changed is the state of the barrel, right, due to rounds fired. Right. I can I can generally establish well that's probably due to fouling if it's not due to temperature the ammo you're right you rule out all the other things that can play into the velocity that you get make it the same test that may maybe that's outside of my threshold um I I I know that if I get up into that like it's a hundred foot per second faster than it was now I start piercing primers and and I'm close enough to that I'm just going to go ahead and clean everything kind of comes back to that baseline if yeah. I effectively cleaned yeah. Foul it um, in, you're good to go. Yep, and it might not return all the way back to where you originally started because the the steel in that barrel will have experienced stresses where there's going to be a lot more cracks and fissures and and, yep. and, and alligator surface skin. finish is different now than it was a couple hundred rounds ago. But the use of a of a reference ammunition can be very very helpful. Yeah, it's and, always nice to have, like we talked about with our part two of this, something that's data driven, mm-hmm. not by hope, by feel, by yeah. Just, it's nice to have a standard to compare to. Yeah, that, that's right. And I guess I, I kind of jumped around there a little bit on, you know, how we clean things. Um, sometimes we will just put the solvent in the barrel um, that's a good solvent that actually works. And then we'll we'll run a patch behind it to dry it out. And we just let the solvent do the work and the patch take out the yeah. service level stuff. Sometimes we'll use a brush. And the brush can help to agitate the, the solvent, you know, kind of aerate it a little yeah. bit. And some of that is, you know, years of experience down there with bore scopes, seeing how things, you know, react to certain round counts. Uh, but it's certainly done systematically. Mm-hmm. And I feel like some of the more, what I'm going to call high performance cartridges, they might need the aid of a brush just with 
I don't know if it's the bore volume or the propellant charge or a combination of both. Um, and then another big thing that I took away uh, down from the lab was just like when we design a cartridge, we want the efficiency of the bullet to do the majority of the work. Mm -hmm. Like with 7PRC, we're going to shoot 175 ELDXs, 160 CXs, or 180 ELD matches. Those are some of the most efficient bullets we can make on a grain for grain scale. Let's let the efficiency of the bullet do the work. Let's not put a huge fuel tank behind it. Mm -hmm. Barrel cleaning is very similar. If we found a, a good effective solvent, let the solvent do the work. I don't need to be scrubbing it with brushes and patch after patch after patch. Let the solvent do its thing. And then, you know, we'll do the work necessary, the minimal work necessary. Um, I've heard from Frank Green at Bartline, anything you can do to keep a rod out of the barrel can limit your chances of messing something up. True statement. Yeah. 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 And, you know, bore guides are, are important to keep things centered up. Yeah. Yeah. That, that can all be helpful. But I mean, at the end of the day, it, I would view it as, as maybe an epidemic that we don't clean, uh, often enough sure um and and when those problems creep up we we don't consider that as maybe part of the equation and i hope that changes a little bit because we've also seen this evolution of both internal at hornady as well as external it's like two parallel paths the amount of volume that we shot in the ballistics lab when i first started working was boy i don't know a quarter of what it is now like on an average daily basis yeah I was going to say 20%. And I would shoot. say, I would say that probably corresponds to recreational competitive, you know, the, the types of shooting that we see now, the, the, the volume is way higher. There's, there's a lot of new shooters out there that don't know much. There's a lot of guys that used to just be a coyote hunter out on the ranch, but now they got into shooting competitions, right? Yep. You're just seeing more, more volume shooting happening. But we're not really seeing a, a a technical focus on well, what are the effects of that? When when are problems going to start to show up? So, I hope this was effective um, in in helping people understand that a little bit more. Again, if you didn't listen to those other podcasts, it would it would be helpful to go get the in depth understanding of that internal ballistic cycle. But yeah, well, I think that's a great uh, a great way to end it. Is yes, those two podcasts, the propellant talk and the internal ballistics podcast, and then also this podcast because there's going to be a part two to this so make sure you know that uh, we'll reference it at the beginning of the the next podcast here but listen to this one digest it and i think this nine pounds of propellant in front of us uh does a great job to illustrate why like i think everybody can say okay i get it you need to clean a gun occasionally and even the people that say oh never clean a rifle they mean never clean until you have problems and mm. then you clean so even the people that say never clean a rifle are also cleaning rifles. This just helps to, you know, bring those ideas together. That's a ton of powder yeah. for, you know, the associated round counts of the cartridges that we're shooting. And I think that's going to inspire people to maybe take this a little bit more seriously. Yeah. Well, there's another thing I had that, that just evoked a thought. Uh, there's been this thought process especially in the in the precision world or in the sniping communities of well i'm not going to clean it because it shoots it shoots better as a function of how many rounds are on it right i got to get it fouled in mm -hmm. right i got to have it keeps shooting better and better and better as i don't clean it and i get hundreds of rounds on it i think a lot of that is lost in the small sample size dispersion analysis that's so common that, that we've all used for so long sure it's very easy to think that the cleaning and the testing we've done does not show that at all. It shows that the, the dispersion is a function of a given bullet powder barrel or the main influences of why you get the dispersion results you get. It's not necessarily a state of fouling. Okay. And that comes from statistically valid sample size testing. So if you have a, if you have a, a, a system that shoots well, I don't expect it to continue to shoot better or let's say a system that shoots bad continue to get better as you don't clean it. i mean i'm sure it could be possible on the fringes but mm. but the the question that's hanging over your head the whole time is when am i going to experience a failure and and if the if the if the magnitude of that question if if the 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 tolerance to a failure is not very high it's unacceptable then i wouldn't recommend it 
what I'd recommend you do is actually do statistically valid dispersion testing and establish, yeah. oh, it actually shoots the same at 100 rounds or 200 mm-hmm. rounds on it. It's not just lost in the noise of small sample size groups. Yep. And uh, like you mentioned at the beginning when you're talking about that, uh, you know, the the levity or how serious it can be for, you know, military or law enforcement, that can also be, you know, for the competitor, you've got, you know, a match entry fee, 250, 300 bucks into a match entry fee, and you pierce, you know, pierce primer and lock your bolt up or something like that, and you're down a stage. Maybe you're done for the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, maybe your firing pin locks up sticking out and you have a slam fire or something like that. Now you've got an ND and you're, you're DQ'd. Right. Um, There's certainly, you know, a lot of weight to some of that. And I'm sure there, you know, there, there'll be folks that listen to this and say, man, I've, I've gone through 20 barrels and I don't clean them. Just I rip them off at this point and put a new one on and I've never had a problem with it. That's totally fine. That That's your experience, but that doesn't make it the rule, right? Yeah. You can't now apply that across the board and expect no problems for anybody ever. Yep. We're talking about more of a 30,000 foot view conversation that, that hopefully, um, uh, gives people a little more understanding of what's happening under the hood. Awesome. Well, Jaden, I think people are going to uh, eat this one up and enjoy it. And again, I think that's going to inspire more people to take this seriously. And I think you're going to have a big group of listeners, me included, that are excited to see this part two, where we talk more about the data-driven approach to barrel maintenance and schedule and, and maybe a little bit more how-to. And I'm looking forward to that. Is there anything else for this 30,000 foot view of why do you need to clean a barrel um, that you think we missed or you want to make a final point? I don't, I don't think so. Um, just un- understand what the repercussions are with and without, uh, without cleaning and keep this example in the back of your mind is how much powder you burn through that tiny little hole. Cause it impresses me every time I've seen it. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Well, it's certainly, and thanks for bringing this up. It certainly is impressive when you see it, especially when you start looking at those big cartridges. It's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. So awesome, Jaden. Thanks for, for filling us in, and we'll look for you on the next one here. Yeah, now we got to figure out how to get this back in those without <laughs> making a mess. Well, we will figure that out. Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you enjoyed this podcast on the barrel maintenance and kind of the how and the why, and hopefully it's got you thinking to maybe take this just a little bit more seriously. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you on the next one.